Okay, we're going to jump into the book of Hebrews tonight, so get your Bible, and uh, we are in chapter 3. Now, we're starting in chapter 3, uh, verse number 7, and our goal tonight is to go through, uh, I think, the end of the chapter. Let me get my, my Bible open, and uh, we're going to go from chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, yes, the goal is to complete chapter 3. Now, this is a section... In fact, the section goes further than this, but this section that we're covering tonight is the first part of what the scholars and the students call the second uh, major exhortation or warning in the book of Hebrews. I don't know if you remember this, but in the introduction we talked about the fact that five times in the writing of the book of Hebrews, he departs from the major theme of the book. What's the major theme of the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Better, right? Come on, people. You've got to track with me. You read off this. Better, okay? Better. Better, better, better. Everything about Jesus is better than what the old covenant was. The new covenant is better. Better promises, better blood, better, uh, better high priests, etc. So five times he kind of deviates from his teaching in the... the uh, process of talking about better and he gives us these five warnings we did the first one a few weeks ago in chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 and every one of these warnings has to do with the word of God now I'm not going to spend too much time on this but the word of God is the key thing in all of our lives we must have the word of the living God hidden in our hearts but there's a a process here there's like a intensely intensifying uh process here because if we begin to drift from the word then we begin to doubt the word and if we doubt the word there becomes a dullness towards the word and if we're dull towards the word we begin to despise the word and how many know ultimately the final sin is defying the word so the writer lays this out if you remember from chapter 2 the first one which we talked about called our great salvation was about neglect and he said how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation and he talks about we must stay tethered we must stay connected to the word of God and he gave the illustration like a ship that would drift away from the dock and it would be lost at sea. The Word of God has got to be our anchor. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned this. is a great illustration. We'll probably bring it out later on in the book of Hebrews because there's a verse that actually says we have an anchor within the veil. Did I talk about that? Do, do you want to know what that means? We have an anchor within the veil. That means that when ships would approach a harbor that was too large for them to get in, a big, huge ship would be outside of a harbor. The harbor was too small for him to get in. What they would do so that he would be um, anchored so that he would not drift, a tugboat would come out. And the tugboat would take the anchor and he would drop the, the, it's too deep out in the open ocean. The winds are too hard, the waves are too large, but the tugboat would take the anchor inside of the harbor and he would drop the anchor and even though the ship was outside of the harbor he had an anchor within the harbor and he was safe and protected we have an anchor within the veil oh come on somebody that'll make you shout right there even though we are in this world and there's tribulation and there's trouble and the winds and the waves and all the adversities I've got an anchor within the veil I've got an anchor already planted in the secret place of the Most High and my anchor that's at the throne of God is going to tether me no matter what comes my way so I cannot drift so then tonight we'll start talking about not doubting the word of God and then in the future there's the warning about being dull to the word of God and then ultimately despising and then defying the word of God so we must pay close attention to the word of of the Lord. So let's begin to jump into the passage. Uh, the title is Do Not Harden Your Hearts, and uh, it's from verse 7 of chapter 3 to verse number 19. 
I don't know if we always do this, but let me just read it for you tonight. So uh, we'll have verses on the screen in a little while, but just go ahead and get your paper Bible, or if you want to grab one of the Bibles in the uh, seat pocket in front of you, let me just read the section, okay? Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation. You do not want God to get provoked. How many can say amen? You do not want your father to get provoked. Can, can you remember that from your childhood? <laughs> the same principle applies to your spiritual father. You do not want to provoke the living God. I was provoked with that generation and said they will always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my oath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be burdened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For he who, uh, for, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we that they were, see, see we, so, oh, sorry. So we see that they were unable to enter because of what? Because of unbelief. So this is a strong warning. All the way from Genesis to Revelation, uh, the Bible is full of warnings from God to uh, get men to turn from their sin and uh, turn from the, the wrath of God. How many know God wants people to seek after him? God wants people to follow him. A lot of people don't really understand that God is not willing. It says in the New Testament, he's not willing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. So even though God is stern sometimes and he gives warnings, like this his heart is for the people not willing that any should perish an old testament equivalency of that is ezekiel 33 11, where it says god has no pleasure in the death of the wicked god does not want to see people perish god does not want to release judgment he wants to receive mercy so that's why his holy spirit gives us a passage like this where we hear the heart of god giving a a nudge giving a a tug to get people to come to the lord because in all sincerity it takes the holy spirit for a person to surrender their lives to Christ. A person may be drawn to God intellectually. They may hear the gospel. They, they may be drawn to it in their mind. They might even believe it in their hearts, but they have to commit themselves to it, and that comes by the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said no one can come to the Father unless the Spirit who sent him draws him. I always say that people can't get saved any old time that they want to, only when the Holy Spirit draws them. And if a person is in a service and there is a uh, altar call and they feel the nudging of the Holy Spirit and they do not surrender, the next time it will be easier for them to say no to the Holy Spirit. And the next time it will be easier than it was the two previous times. And it could get to a point, my spirit shall not always strive with man, that they would sit in the presence of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit would reach out to them and they would go uh, out of the service unfazed by it because they have just allowed their heart to become hardened to the word of God. Do not repent of their sins. To me, that's the same thing that I've taught a lot of times about the difference between believing in God versus believing on God unto salvation. We can't just believe on the Lord uh, or in the Lord. We must believe on him. So the warning here is to who? What's the whole book of Hebrews written to? Jewish 
Christians, right? It's to warn those who know the gospel, who it's firm, it's truth, but who also, uh, because of sin or fear of persecution or lack of total surrender, they have not totally surrendered their lives to God. And uh, the writer to the Hebrews is under the Holy Spirit pre, uh, sharing his deep concern for his fellow Jews. Remember, that's one of the themes from the whole book. He's writing to the Jewish Christians to tell them it's all about Jesus. And they cannot rest now in the Old Testament sacrifices. They cannot rest in the law. They cannot rest in their heritage. Just because they're sons of Abraham by heritage does not mean they're sons of God by regeneration. So he continues to warn them to come to Jesus and uh, so to do that, he gives a familiar story to them. And we talked last time, who was their most famous hero of the whole Old Testament? Moses. So he's again using the frame of reference about Moses, and he gives them the illustration, do not harden your heart like the children of Israel did under the time of Moses. So in our introduction, this is letter A, the illustration of Israel. He gives an illustration. He gets their, uh, gets their attention. Notice what he says in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the time that they did not have the faith to go into the promised land. They came out of, uh, is, uh, of Egypt, but because of their unbelief, they had to wander around Mount Sinai for 40 years. 40 years of wandering in the wilderness of doubt and unbelief. So his illustration, his frame of reference is, don't be like them. Um, now, the psalmist, this is actually a quote, what you see there in verse number uh, 7 and 8, 9 and 10 is actually a quote. This is from Psalm 95. If you read Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11, you'll see it's the same thing. That's another thing that the writer to the Hebrews does. He uses the Old Testament. He continually quotes the Old Testament. Now, why would he do that? Because that was their Bible. They knew the Old Testament. That was their word, the Torah, the law, the prophets, the, the words of the psalmist. And so he continually brings them back, not to say we're destroying the foundation, but to say we're building upon the foundation that you already had, which was the apostles and the prophets and the psalms. So he says, don't be like they were that had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. He says to them that are on the edge of decision, don't harden your hearts. Don't do what the children of Israel did. Don't uh, wander in the wilderness of doubt and unbelief. So then the second thing we're going to see in the introduction letter B is a neat little thing, which is proof of the Bible's inspiration. Now, what do we mean by inspiration? God breathed. That's what the word inspired mean. Holy men of God spake as they were breathed upon, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I know you know this, and I'm, I'm not going to linger long, but uh, we believe that the Word of God from cover to cover is inspired by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Everything that was written was written by the Holy Spirit's superintendency. Uh, yes, people wrote the Bible. And you probably hear people all the time that say, oh, the Bible's just a book written by men. Well, yeah, you could say that in theory, but in all reality, it was the Holy Spirit that oversaw the whole process. In fact, the more you realize that, the more powerful the Bible becomes because there were over 40 different authors over 
a period of 1,500 years, and they wrote 66 books. I used to have this memorized, how many chapters and actually how many words. I don't remember right now. But every single thing written in the Bible is on one subject, choose ye this day whom you'll serve. And Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Not one contradiction, not, not one error. It is inerrant. It is infallible. And the only way to explain all that is by believing that it was 100% inspired by the Holy Spirit. So here's a neat statement. Look at verse 7, the first statement. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. So this is a little bit intellectual, but hang in here with me. This is one of the clearest testimonies in the Scripture of its own divine inspiration. The, whole, the, the, the Bible itself is testifying about itself that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. You see that? As the Holy Spirit says. So this is the Bible itself claiming in its own words that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so also, um, even though Hebrews 3 is quoting from Psalm, what did I say, Psalm 95, it's again a double reference. It's like what the Holy Spirit inspired when David or whoever the psalmist was that wrote the 95th Psalm. I think it was David, but I'd have to study and, and research that because I'm not exactly positive. But whatever psalmist it was, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit when he wrote it. So now it's being quoted. It's doubly inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's applicable because God is the author of of the scripture. Uh, 2 Peter 1.21 is a great memory verse. No prophecy was ever made by an act of a human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke the very word of God. Okay? So the basic warning that is from the Holy Spirit, because he tells us himself, he's the one that authored it, it is what? Do not harden your hearts. And that word, harden your heart, is mentioned three times here. It's in verses 7 and 8. It's in verse 13. It's in verse 15. In fact, even when we get into the next chapter, it's in verse 7 of chapter 4. And uh, then it says, do not harden your heart today. There is an emphasis indicating urgency. It means now, today not necessarily mean in the next 24 hours. It doesn't necessarily say, you know, sometime in the next several hours, but it means right now. Do not harden your heart. So that, that refers to like a period of grace, a period of opportunity, and, and as long as we have this ability to decide to put God first in our lives, he says, you'll never know how long this period of time will last but do not presume upon the grace of God and do not harden your hearts now. Here's an illustration for you. D.L. Moody, very famous um, preacher. I guess early on in his ministry when he would preach strong like hellfire and brimstone, I mean literally, that he would say something like at the end of his message, like, now go home and think about what I just said. And one night in Chicago. That's what he said to the people. Go back home and think about what I said and come back tomorrow night ready to make a decision. Well, by chance, that night the Chicago fire broke out. And some who had been in the congregation that night, that was the last, that was the last opportunity they had. So he never ever said that statement again. He always then emphasizes what the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't do tomorrow. Wait until tomorrow what you have the opportunity to do today. And that's what I said in the beginning. If a person says no to the conviction of the Holy Spirit tonight, it'll be easier for them to say no tomorrow night. And if it'll be easier the next time and the next time until they can sit in the middle of a spirit-filled presentation where the presence of the Holy Spirit is so alive and they will not feel a thing. Why? Because what is the warning here? Their heart has become what? It has become hardened. Um, 
There's another verse, this is in Romans, I believe, where it talks about their consciences are seared as with a hot iron. Um, I don't want to linger here. Um, I knew someone one time as a kid, uh, to be honest with you, and it just seemed to me like this kid had no conscience whatsoever. This kid continuously did wrong, continuously did bad things, and had no conscience of any kind. He just never felt bad. And, and the tragedy is his conscience had never been trained by the Word of God. Now, if you've heard me say this before, I don't think that the uh, wisdom of Pinocchio is, is wise for serving God. Always let your conscience be your guide. You can only let your conscience be your guide if your conscience is trained by the Holy Spirit. If your conscience is trained by the culture, if your conscience is seared, if your conscience is um, ignored for so long that it no longer has a resonance in your mind and your heart, then, you know, a lot of people, and, and this is very, I, I'm kind of off my subject, but I'll, I'll get back there in a minute. I'll just take a few rabbit trails tonight. Is that okay? Uh, how many like fried rabbit? We're, we're going to catch this thing, and, and we're going to fry him up for dinner, and we'll put some gravy with it, and it'll be wonderful. Can you say amen? <laughs> Diana's going to cook it for us. In fact, she's going to skin it for us, too. We just bring the rabbit over to the Bermuda's house, and she'll skin that thing and cook it for us. Come on, Brother Mauricio. Come on. We're getting full of the Holy Ghost right now. Praise God. But uh, what I started to say... <laughs> what did I start to say? What's that? Okay. But what we need to do is, of course, surrender our hearts to God at the very time that the Holy Spirit leads us. Do not harden your heart. So now let's get into the scripture. And it says what? Do not harden your heart as in the day of rebellion. So here's the illustration that the Holy Spirit's going to bring in from uh, uh, more than 400 years that Israel uh, had been in Egypt and uh, 200 or more of those years they were slaves, but during that time they allowed their hearts to become hardened. When the heart is soft, the conscience is sensitive. The intellect is, is hungry about God, but when the heart becomes hard, the conscience is seared, the understanding is no longer receptive, and our hearts are no longer pliable and responsive, but, but hardened. And he says, do not harden your hearts. So, um, he also says this in verse 9, do not harden your hearts on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test. <laughs> and what does it say they did? They saw my works for 40 years. They saw the miracles of God. They saw the um, plagues. They saw what God did to cause Pharaoh to say, let my people go. And yet they hardened their hearts. Unbelief never has enough proof to believe. Unbelief, even though there is proof, unbelief never has enough proof. It's always asking for more proof. And I'm just going to read this from these notes. Sometimes that can simply be a pretext or an excuse, a delaying tactic. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, the problem is not that you can't believe in me. What's the problem? The problem is that you won't believe in me. And a lot of times I think that is the case. People say, oh, I wish I could believe. You can. You just won't. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be. And they say, oh, I just, I just wished I could. I had somebody say to me one time, and they were kind of saying this condescendingly to tell you the truth. I, I wish I was simple enough like you Christians to just believe that everything is true. Well, he could believe if he chose to. He, he was not willing to believe. It was not an, a, a matter of ability. It was a matter of willingness. And uh, he, Jesus said to the Pharisees, the problem is you will not come to me. I'm going to quote Pastor Michel. Uh, this is not in the Bible, but it's a wonderful statement. An excuse always sounds the best to the one that made it. 
<laughs> Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> An excuse. Uh, how many people told you excuses, and when they tell you their excuse, you're just like, are you kidding me? That, that is such a lame excuse. That is just stupid. That is but it sounded great to them. To them, it, thought, it, it sounded like a wonderful response. An excuse always sounds the best to the one that made it. But the people would not come to God. And so God was what? He was provoked. <laughs> He was angry with that generation. Um, God said, not simply unhappy or disappointed, but literally vexed, literally incensed. God was angry uh, with the people because they went astray and they would not believe. So we don't have a whole lot of time left, but let's break this down then into the exposition. You know, I always like the one, two, threes. I always like to leave you some structure, some, some skeleton uh, bones to put the meat on. So in verse 12, uh, we have the invitation. The invitation is to take heed. So look at verse number 12. Verse number 12 says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. The, the invitation is take heed, beware, uh, take advantage, realize that the greatest sin in the world is unbelief. Jesus said on one occasion, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he says, in sin, because men do not believe in me there is a sin unto death now that's a whole nother passage and it's a whole nother study but what is the sin unto death the sin unto death is not adultery it's not doing drugs it's not smoking dope it's not stealing it's not knocking off a, god can forgive of all that stuff what's the one sin that god cannot forgive he well yeah right blasphemy against the holy spirit but that's a unique thing that's actually giving credit to the Holy Spirit for something that God does. But outside of that, what's this one sin that God cannot, believe, cannot uh, forgive? The sin of unbelief. Why can he not forgive the sin of unbelief? Because he can't forgive the person that does not believe. In fact, we'll get to it later. How many want a cliffhanger here? It says later on in the book of Hebrews... It says this in chapter 6, that it is impossible for the person that has fallen away to be brought back to repentance again. And we say, well, why? Is that, if an unbeliever, if a backslider can't come back to God? Well, he explains to us why. Because he says they have uh, uh, continually subjected the Son of God to open disgrace. In other words, have refused to believe. If a person is un, in unbelief, they cannot be forgiven because they cannot stop unbelieving. Of course, they can repent if they would stop not unbelieving, stop not believing. So anyway, we'll get to that when we get there, and it'll be, it'll be um, very easy to understand. But the invitation is to take heed, okay? So I want to encourage everyone in this room tonight, take heed. Take heed. Be aware. Take inventory. Evaluate your life. If you feel like you are getting hardened, if you feel like there is a resistance, if you feel like there is a, uh, a, a hardness, a, a, uh, uh, you know, an insensitivity, if you feel like you know, it just doesn't move you like it once did, then what's his admonition here? Take heed. Take an inventory. And lest there be in any of you an evil, an unbelieving heart that's leading you away from the living God. So then here's number two, the instruction from verse 13. The instruction is to exhort one another daily. But exhort, verse 13, one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be burdened by the deceitfulness of sin. I love that where it says, exhort one another today as long as it is called today. That's kind of poetic language. That's kind of a, a figuratively way of saying, don't put off till tomorrow what you need to do today. Repent today as long as it is called today. Because today is the day of salvation. Today 
is the day to give your life to Christ. So he says, encourage one another or exhort one another. And that's a, a strong word that actually is from the same root as the word that we use for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is who? He's the paraclete. You've heard that, right? The parakletos, the one that's called alongside to encourage us. He's the Holy Spirit. That same word here is in verse number 13. But exhort to paraclete, come alongside and encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened, and here's a big word, by the deceitfulness of sin deceitfulness is is trickery it sin seldom appears as it really is it always masks itself it lies and deceives and when a person becomes spiritually hardened he's rarely aware of the full result of his sin i always like to give a simple illustration uh, all of satan's apples look great they all are red and polished and they look delicious but all of satan's apples have worms <laughs> and uh, you don't see the worm until after you've bitten into it and i know it's a bad joke and i've said it before but i i can't resist you know what's worse than biting into an apple and finding a worm finding half a worm that that is always worse than finding a whole worm because you're wondering where the other half is i know it's cheesy Bless, you know, I, I, you guys keep laughing. I keep going there. So, you know, you keep egging me on. But deceitfulness, um, deceitfulness. Uh, maybe you've heard this phrase. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. What's, what makes the difference? The consistency of the material. You ever heard people go through... Uh, did Siri just wake up over there? I said consistency, and Sister Siri thought, so I said S-I-R-I. I heard somebody's phone. Turn to your iPhone and say, stop talking back to the preacher. Oh, it was comedy. Say an amen. Uh, no, I, I, don't think, I don't think the people at Apple are in agreement with what I'm teaching tonight. I, I like their phones, but I hate their philosophical liberal idealism just going to let that go okay all right what where, where was I? I just get too familiar with you guys I'm, I'm way too comfortable and I I feel right at home and we yeah wax and clay thank you so much I appreciate that yeah some people go through really really terrible circumstances and, and they come out of it what tender broken melted before God other people go through the exact same circumstances and they come out, what, hardened and, and rebellious and mean-spirited. What's the difference? The difference is the consistency of what their life is all about. Because the, uh, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. So have a heart that is not deceitful, a heart that is not looking for an excuse an excuse always sounds the best to the person that makes it. Don't have a heart that's looking for a way out, but have a heart that's looking for a way in. Don't have a heart that's looking for something that you can blame it on somebody else, but look for a heart that's wanting to, no matter what happens, use it as an opportunity to draw in closer to God. Don't let it drive you away. Don't become bitter, but become better. And, and draw in closer to the Lord. So then thirdly is the issue. The uh, invitation is to take heed. The instruction is to exhort one another daily. And what is the issue? The issue is unbelief. So let's finish it up here with verse 15. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For... Who were those who heard and yet rebelled? It's a rhetorical question, but what's the answer? Who was it that heard and rebelled? It was those that, who had left Egypt. God delivered them. 
They walked across the Red Sea on dry ground. They saw the miracles of God. They saw the signs and the wonders of, of Moses before Pharaoh. They, they saw the, 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 the um, ungodly uh, Pharaoh finally acknowledge the, the power of, of Moses' God. And he said, go on. Let my, let, Moses said, let my people go. And Pharaoh eventually said, okay. The people saw all that. And yet, after seeing all that, they left Egypt, led by Moses, and they rebelled against God. Verse 17, and with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Same, same answer, right? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Same answer, but to those who were disobedient. So... We see that they were unable to enter. Why? Because of unbelief. So again, the answer to it all is unbelief. Now I'm just going to read something here for you at the end from these notes. And then uh, we're going to conclude. Many say, many say, I can't believe. I know you'll have somebody come to your mind. uh, Some... uh, professing intellectual some person that wants to promote themselves as being very analytical very intellectual very pragmatic of course the bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no god and uh we have a day for them a holiday it's on april the first but uh let me just read it for you many say i can't believe I've had a pragmatic, empirical mind that has to see the facts, weigh all the evidence. But everyone lives by faith. We live by faith when we go into a restaurant and eat the food without questioning its safety. When driving down the highway, we are not in constant fear that around the next bend in the road will lead us into a river where there is no bridge. We trust that the people who made the highway and the people who traveled over it before us that it's safe we live by faith almost constantly and we can put our faith in the highway department or we can put our faith in the people who prepare our food surely we can put our faith in the god of the universe to not trust him is fatal so as i said an excuse sounds best to the one that made it my contention is those that blame their intellectualism or they blame their rationalism, or they blame their high IQs, you know, and they'll poke fun at Christians. Well, Christianity is for simplic- it's for simpletons. It's for people that are not as, as smart, is not as, as read, not as well studied, not as intellectual as I am. That's just a smokescreen because they believe in a lot of things with much less evidence than the Word of God. And here's how I... I, here's how I would suggest respond to that with another question. So, oh, I see. So you have thoroughly investigated the claims of Christ, have you? And of course they haven't. Because anyone that search, starts out to thoroughly investigate the claim, claims of Christ, there have been people that have written books. One of the most famous ones is called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. I don't know if you've heard of that. Another one is... Um, What's the title of the other book I'm trying to... C- Case for Christ. Yeah, thank you so much. This guy was a, an investigative reporter. He, he was a journalist, and he hated Christianity. He thought it was for weak, simple-minded people that didn't know any better. And so he set out to study to prove that Christianity was a hoax. So anybody want to guess what happened? The more he investigated, the more he studied the claims of Christ... He found out that everything that Jesus said was true. And every claim, every um, proof of resurrection, every proof of the prophetic veracity of Scripture did not give him an excuse. It literally gave him proof that the Bible really was the Word of God. Jesus was who he said he was. And this person then gave his life to Christ. And he's written a book that's that's very uh, well read, very famous book Uh, and so uh, you know I don't know how successful that would be but you know a person that 
that wants to throw that smoke screen and they want to tell you, oh, they're very smart and they're very intellectual. You know, oh, well, you've, 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 you've studied all the claims of Christ then, have you? Why don't you explain that to me? And of course, they would stutter like nobody's business because they haven't done that. They've usually uh, just used an excuse. And I love that statement. The excuse sounds the best to the one that makes it. <laughs> so, uh, yes, are you just celebrating there or waving or... Okay. Okay, it's also a movie. Uh huh. Same type thing. Yeah. All right. Well, let's stand tonight and. Uh, I'll just speak the blessing of the Lord over you, and we'll continue to go on next week, verse by verse, in our study of the book of Hebrews. So uh, just leave that screen up like that for a couple of seconds, uh, Rick, and I want everybody to memorize that word so that, so that next week when I say, what is this study all about? You won't say, oh, uh, you know, I'm not sure. You'll shout out, better, 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 better. So, Father God, I just bless the people tonight. Give them a joy on their journey. And uh, I thank you, God, that the Word of God is literally what it is. It is the holy, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of the living God. You've created a book that says exactly what you want it to say. And you did that by telling people on the earth exactly what to write by the inspiration of your Spirit. So help us grow in the word, help us learn the word, walk in the word, because faith comes by hearing the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Unite, voices unite, raise your tears.